right, here we go, guys. This is guitar number 106. to play kind of dynamically there and you know not just strum out a bunch of chords so you could hear the balance between the bass and the trebles which is really good um, and obviously I mean I almost don't even have to say that it projects and sustains So yeah, this is really exciting. I'm not gonna play this much. I'm, by the way, this is feeding directly into my uh, microphone on my GoPro camera. This is not a sophisticated recording setup. I simply don't have anything like that. That's just not the kind of thing that I do. I don't really have like a fancy audio engineering setup like other um, online people do, YouTubers and such. Um, but that's okay. So you got to hear it at least through the shotgun mic on my GoPro, which is okay, actually. It's pretty good. And uh, now I'm going to actually go through the guitar, and I think this will be educational for a lot of you builders out there. And I'm just going to talk about the different features on the guitar and why I did what I did, yada yada. All right, let's get into it. All right, so we'll just start from the headstock and work our way down. Obviously, the first thing that jumps out to you here is the wacky orientation of the tuners and the tuners themselves, which are themselves atypical. These are Steinberger gearless tuners, and so they work completely different from your regular tuner that twists around the post. These you actually lock into a hole in the post, and then the post dives down into the headstock so there's no gears that connect together so hence there's no gear ratio but they have the equivalent of a 40 to 1 gear ratio which if you're familiar with gear ratios the highest gear ratio that i know of outside of this 40 to 1 is 21 to 1 so it's uh, about double plus they're just really simple and quick to change strings on because you just pass them through the hole and lock them down, and uh, that's it. Then you tune them up. Now, I've actually countersunk these into the headstock, so these aren't resting right on the finish of the headplate. They're actually countersunk down into the headplate. And I do that really for aesthetic reasons, having to do with the finish deforming, or if it were a lacquer finish, it'd be chipping around the edges. This is a true oil finish, by the way. Here, I'll give you a shot of these on the back side. So this is actually where you tune a guitar like this on the back, not on the front. It's a little deceiving. You might think you turn these. Those are the string locks that I was just talking about. Okay, so the head plate itself is Macassar ebony, which is like this really nice stripey ebony. It has like caramel bands or stripes throughout it. You'll see more of it as we travel down through the fretboard and the bridge because they are both Macassar ebony as well. Okay, our nut here, this is a bone nut. I always use bone nuts. Actually, that's not true. I have made nuts out of ebony, nuts and saddles, but uh, those are few and far between. Usually it's bone, never plastic, or any other synthetics like tusk and all that. Uh, I like the real thing. Oh, one more thing about the tuners before we jump to the fretboard is the orientation here gives us a straight pull across the nut. So a straight pull of the strings rather than the strings hitting the nut and then splaying off to the side as you see on so many other guitars, which is just a less efficient way to use the strings energy budget. Okay, we want that force vector going in one direction straight down rather than in two directions down and across. All right, now let's jump over to the fingerboard, fretboard, whatever you want to call it. Okay, so Macassar Ebony as well, and David really wanted to have some abalone dots in here. I haven't 
used abalone before and I gotta say it was a bit of a pain in the butt <laughs> to get them in there. I actually had to pop a couple of them out a couple times just because it has these blackish streaks and as you sand and level the shell material down and any of you guys who have worked with any kind of shell like mother of pearl or abalone know that as you sand it down you reveal different layers and so the look that you have on the top surface when you install it isn't necessarily what you get as you um, explore through those layers and with the abalone in particular it was just a back and forth game of you know i'd be leveling the the fretboard after they were all in there and one of them would get this nasty black mark right in the middle and then uh, by the time i cleaned that up there'd be another black mark appearing somewhere else so i just felt like i was chasing my tail trying to get them all to look good but with some careful and particular work on each one individually and with popping them out and just putting new ones in a couple times i ended up getting a nice consistent greenish abalone look without big nasty black splotches there's a little bit of black in there but it's uh, attractive looking it actually looks right okay and while we're at the fretboard i think it's appropriate to talk about scale length this is a 25.34 inch scale length which is your orchestra model scale length okay that is considered by the way long scale now the difference between long scale and short scale to the player essentially is that the long scale is going to feel tighter it's going to be the strings are literally at a higher tension and the short scale is going to feel looser so it's easier to do bends and things like that on that short scale instrument many people like the long scale because it projects better you actually get a different tone out of having higher tension and generally um, all the things that we want like more sustain more projection more volume come from the instrument being high tension you can prove this to yourself just by down tuning the strings on any guitar and yeah it's going to sound bad because it's going to be out of tune uh, but also you're going to have a decrease in all those things that i mentioned so long scale generally speaking is good for tone uh, but also it's good for pitch stability while you're playing which if you're a player who doesn't want to bend notes right that's just not how you play maybe you play blue, bluegrass or something like that where you're just doing clean runs then you actually want the string to be nice and tight and stable and not to be accidentally bending slightly as you play it which would throw your pitch off you know saying all that kind of makes short scale seem like it's a bad thing it's really not i love a triple o is a short scale version of the om and i love the triple o as much it's it's just different um, i love it as much as the om that guitar i find to be better for more of like lead playing especially if you do play the blues or you just like to bend notes and do things like that you can be more expressive on a short scale guitar because of the looseness the fret wire here is evo gold uh, evo gold is not actually gold don't get excited don't pluck it out of your guitar and try and hawk it at a gold, cash for gold place it is a copper alloy it naturally has that gold color which looks really cool but honestly that's not the reason to use it for the color it is a much more durable and wear resistant material than nickel silver it's not as wear resistant as stainless steel but honestly it doesn't need to be as wear resistant as stainless steel um, i think stainless steel is is pretty much overkill you, you don't need stainless steel when you have something like evo gold i'd say um, stainless steel is kind of like hell on your tools uh okay so let's keep on going down to the body there it is so the soundboard is sitka spruce and uh the back is dalbergia tucurensis which is commonly called nicaraguan rosewood which is a i say that and it sounds like it's not a true rosewood uh, dalbergia is a true rosewood um and what might throw you off here is that it also doesn't really look 
like a typical rosewood, because usually rosewoods have that kind of purplish, blackish purplish colors. Um, but this is really like a sandstone orangey brown. And actually a lot of the Nicaraguan rosewood that I've seen does have that purplish color, but this just happens to be on the far lighter end of the spectrum. Because all woods, and you see this a lot with mahogany, which I know a lot of you guys work with, um, all woods have a, a range of color tones that that can be a you know can be found amongst them. And uh, Nicaraguan rosewood just has a pretty wide range, I've found. Um, so yeah, we actually me and David picked this one out. Um, I had him on you know the phone while I was at Hearn Hardwoods, and we picked this one out specially just for that lighter color and that look and the cool sapwood stripe right down the middle there. Okay. Um, the rosette itself is made out of offcuts from the back and the sides. Okay, so that is also Nicaraguan rosewood. It is cut into individual slices and assembled so that the grain always moves radially out from the center. I use a special jig that I also make in the shop here and sell to you guys. It's called the Radial Rosette Maker. A lot of you guys out there have the jig already, so you know what I'm talking about. And it makes the job of making rosettes like this uh, really fast and really easy. It makes it a cut and dry process, really. And so traveling from the soundboard now to the bridge, we've got a sort of newish bridge design that I've been doing. I'm sure you guys have seen some of the other wackier designs I've done. This one's pretty slim and trimmed down, which is great for bridges. Obviously you want bridges to have a very low weight and a very low footprint on the top. And I think this bridge really achieves that. I also designed this bridge. Oddly enough, I designed it to make finishing easier. So here's the deal. Classical makers, if you go back far enough, it was all hand rubbed finishes that they were using. And so they actually designed their bridges. If you look at old classical bridges or even new ones, because uh, let's face it, in the classical world, tradition is strong. Tradition is everything. And so everything kind of looks like it did in the beginning. But uh, the point I'm getting at is classical bridges have all these contours and this rounded over look to it. It's not boxy like a Martin guitar bridge is. And the reason for that is because when you're hand rubbing a finish on an instrument that is fully assembled, meaning the bridge is attached and the neck is attached, if you have, if you're trying to rub into the corners where you have this steep 90 degree wall, like you might see on a boxier bridge, it's impossible. Uh, I'll, I'll say it's very, very difficult, but it might even be impossible to get the finish to really spread out evenly and be clean and uh, level with the surrounding finish in those corners. Uh, trust me, I've tried forever to get um, hand rubbed finishes to look good with boxy bridges and I can get them pretty close, but you can always, if you look at it, inspect it close enough, you can always kind of tell that there's something going on right in those 90 degree corners. Now, if you design your bridge more like a classical bridge, you, with these curves and contours coming up like this over the bridge, your rag can just kind of sweep right over the bridge and it's a lot easier to get a seamless look. So that might be interesting to some of you guys if you're struggling with finishing around the bridge, which I know is a common struggle. Um, of course, a lot of people just finish uh, before they attach the bridge, and that's fine. So let's see what else. It's a bone saddle, not surprising because we have a bone nut. This saddle is fully intonated, and it has channels cut for the strings to rest in. So typically on the guitar, you obviously have slots cut into the nut, but your typical guitar won't have slots cut into the saddle. 
the strings will just uh, naturally kind of pull to where they're going to pull and th that's where they'll stay. But if you cut notches into the saddle, you can actually direct where those strings are supposed to be and set the string spacing on the saddle side a little more evenly. Furthermore, it's never going to shift or slide when you're playing very vigor vigorously, which you can actually do um, if you don't have notches cut. And, uh, and then finally, at, uh, at each of these notches, I have separately intonated each string to get the intonation just a little bit better than you naturally get from saddle that is not fully compensated. And then the pins, we got to talk about the pins, right? Because those look pretty cool. This design on the top of the pins is called Parisian Eye. I don't make these, I order them from LMI. That's Luthier's Mercantile. So if you guys are interested in these pins, go, go to LMI and check them out. They are really cool. They're called, if you type in Parisian Eye, you should be able to find them. These are unslotted bridge pins. So there's no slot in the pin itself, which means that the bridge itself has to be slotted and has been slotted to accept the string, which tonally is the best way of doing it. And mm, I could get into why, but I don't know if I want to go that deep. I think a lot of you, a lot of you guys know why. Well, I'll talk about it a little bit. Okay. <laughs> Let's talk about it a little bit. Let's get into it. Okay, so you can have a slotted bridge pin. Let me go get one and I'll show you. Uh, now you guys got me going into the weeds here. All right, so I got both a slotted bridge pin and an unslotted bridge pin. So I can show you the difference. Many of you know the difference, but... So there's the slot that I'm talking about. So this is kind of just a, an easy, quicker, lazier way of fastening your strings to the bridge because you don't have to cut notches or slots into the bridge itself, the thickness, the gauge of the string will simply rest in that giant slot right there. Now these are perfectly smooth all the way around. These are unslotted. The string does not slot into this. So therefore we need to cut slots into the bridge itself, which means that the ball end of the string is not going to jam up against the pin. Rather the ball end of the string is going to sit just a little bit ahead of the pin itself and will be fully resting on the bridge plate and that is very important for the anchoring and the uh, resonant potential that you get from a more perfect anchoring to that bridge plate. Furthermore, when you slot your bridge, you can curve and ramp that slot uh, like this, right? to create a ramp that sets your angle towards the saddle so you can appropriately give yourself more or less angle uh, depending on whether or not you need it. You can control that angle and that's very good for tone also. Okay, that wasn't too bad. <laughs> we, we got in and out of that pretty, pretty quickly. Let's uh, jump over to uh, well, we haven't talked about the bracing. You can't see the bracing. I could grab the camera and pull it down. Okay, so you can't see the bracing too easily with the strings on like this, but this is a lattice braced back, or I call it a modified lattice bracing. And I just like the lattice bracing. I find, or I think that in theory, it is the appropriate way to brace a back. Ladder bracing is the standard, but really that has become the standard for more economical reasons. It's very easy to do ladder bracing. Now, in all seriousness, the back is not nearly as important of a tone contributor than the top. And so being a bit more economical with your bracing strategy, I think is okay. I'm not against ladder braced guitars and I still build some of them. But uh, if I'm asked what is the most appropriate way to brace a back, I think it's the lattice bracing. And um, 
Yeah, I'm not sure if it makes a noticeable difference yet. I've only done about five or six lattice braced guitars, but um, at least in theory, it makes sense to me. So I'm gonna keep doing them. And the soundboard bracing is X bracing. X bracing is always the king. <laughs> Almost everyone does uh, X bracing on steel string acoustic guitars for the top. Um, everyone has kind of like their own little modification of it. Uh, I definitely make sure my braces are taller and skinnier than your typical Martin X bracing. I think tall and skinny a la the cube rule is the way to go. Uh, but yeah, other than that, I mean, it's an X brace and I voiced it and um, not much else to say about that. Okay, uh, let's see. Picking up the pieces here. Is there anything else left to talk about? It's Honduran mahogany for the neck. It's a nice C-shaped neck. And an inch and three quarters, I believe, at the nut. Um, yeah, an inch and three quarters. And uh, ebony binding. Okay. Well, just wanted to share that with you guys. This is ready. Well, almost ready. I actually still have to put a pick guard on it. You can see no pick guard right now. Some gu guitars I put a pick guard on, some I don't. Uh, it all depends on the player's preference. If you're purely a finger style player, you might desire not having one on your top but most people do want a pick guard uh, even if they only pick occasionally with a an actual plastic pick so i use mylar for the pick guards and this is what it will look like when it has the pick guard on there here's my template something like that um, not that thick again this is just a template but uh, the only reason I haven't put the pick guard on is because I'm waiting on the mylar. I am out of a material. But once that pick guard goes on there, this thing is ready to go in the case and be shipped to California. All right, guys. That's all I got for you today. I hope you got something out of that. Let me know what you think. Let me know uh, what you think of some of my ideas there or the guitar itself. Um, I, I just love feedback. So I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye for now. If you learned something here, please give this video a like and subscribe so you can be notified when I release a new DIY guitar making video. And if you want to really learn more, take one of my structured online courses at ericschaferguitars.com or register for a hands-on guitar building workshop here with me in Burnville, Pennsylvania.